Hey everyone, Hexlex here, coming at you with some more Master Duel. Specifically, I have got some more Bird Up replays to share with you guys at the Platinum 1 rank, as always. Now, let's go ahead and look at the replays. In the last video, or at least the last one I recorded, we took a look at some of these replays here, and I actually ended up uh, with some pretty good games in the uh, latter half of the day as well. And actually, this I can't wait to get to this when it gets time to duel. First of all, I love this guy's name. Second of all, I, you know what? I, I remember liking this replay a lot. I'm just going to start with it. I'm not going to tease you guys. I'm not going to be like, ooh, we'll get to this one later so that you watch later into the video. We're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. First of all, time to duel. I love this guy's username. I saw it and immediately was like, dude, this guy is great. This person, I should say. Uh, in any case, so they have the Max C, but we've got Ash Blossom here. And as I mentioned in the last video where we watched Bird Up replays, uh, I have thought about putting Crossout Designator in this deck as a counter to Max C, but we also have the Ash Blossoms, of course, in addition to the Called by the Graves. And Ash Blossom is a really versatile card because obviously its main function isn't even to counter Max C in most decks, but in this deck, it, it kind of does become a main function of the card. So we're able to go into a Tri-Brigade combo here, and in, this is going to let us set up a Simorg, which is funny because you would think, you know, like in the Amirage into the, you know, Keros play is not that particularly... You would think like, oh, it's not impressive in this deck, right? Because we can't do the stuff that Trizu can do. But no, we can still set up like a pretty good board, even with just the Tri-Brigade cards alone. Which I think is a testament to really how strong Tri-Brigade is. I'm really interested, I, I I don't imagine it'll come out until, you know, at least midway through the season and then not take effect until the end of the season. I really wonder what, like, a future ban list for Master Duel is going to look like. I, because, you know, it's pretty clear right now that Trizu is arguably the strongest deck. You, like, it and, and um, Virtual World are pretty firmly in Tier 1. I would still say Drytron is definitely in tier 1 as well. I've seen some people kind of disagree with that. Bird Up, I, I have noticed a slight decline in how many I've been seeing on the ladder. I do think it is quite possible that Bird Up is on its way down to tier 2. Sky Striker, I was a little, in my, you know, best decks for ranked video, I know I said, oh, I think this deck is tier 1. I think it was probably closer to tier 1 towards the end of season 1. I would probably definitely put it, probably definitely, I'm really bad about saying that. I would definitely put it in tier 2 as of right now, just as where we're at in season 2 right now. So, you know, in a way that does kind of outdate some of the information from that video, but, you know, it's a meta game. Like any other card game, it's constantly evolving. Here I'm talking over this replay I said I loved showing, and I, I loved it because it was the mirror match. And this is actually, like... This is the first time I've played the mirror match where one of us, where it wasn't just like, oh, one of us had Max C and couldn't stop it, and then, like, the duel's pretty much over. This was, like, the first real back and forth I've had in a mirror match, and it was pretty cool. Like, so, honestly, I, I could have stopped my opponent from comboing off, right? But I let them kind of go into a Max C. Because if you remember my hand, I should have pointed this out earlier. If you remember my hand before I maxied, or you could even go back and rewind the video a bit, I didn't really have many options to set up a play of my own. So I thought to myself, well, you know, I could imperm and stop my opponent from comboing off. Or I could do this, right? Or no, Ash, sorry. I could Ash and stop my opponent from comboing off. Or I could Max C instead, because I can't really combo off. I don't have, like, a comeback play right now. So that's what I ended up doing here. I just ended up Max Cing, because I knew I could... I knew what the end board was going to look like, and as I kept drawing with Max C, I kept seeing outs, and I'm like, okay, you know what? With this hand, I'm pretty confident in my ability to play through my opponent's setup board. And honestly, I was more scared of the negate from Apex Avian than anything else here. Because, you know, the Utopic Draco is only one monster negate. This Ensemble is only two bounces. I'm very confident in our ability to play through those and still be able to have a really, really solid inboard that actually gets, ends up getting us ahead on the board. 
So I really wanted to save as the combo, you know, as my opponent's combo was going on and as I was drawing cards, I decided, okay, I want to save the Ash for the Simorg, so I, they don't get the Apex save again. I know they'll negate with the Utopic Future, but I can just imperm the Utopic Future, and that way they don't get their, uh, they don't get their, um, their Apex save again. Yeah, that Omni Negate is pretty nasty, but you see our opponent is going to end up using now all of their responses. They no longer have any bounces. They already stole the Recital Starling. And we're still going to have plays at this point. Now, our Nervil does get hit by the called by. That was a bit of a questionable decision on my part, was to call by my opponent's Nervil, because it did mean my own Nervils on my upcoming turn were going to be negated. However, we have the Barrel Canary. We can go into, or not, not Ensemble Robin, this is Assembly Nightingale. Assembled Nightingale, excuse me. We can go into a symbol Nightingale, whose really only purpose is to go into Downward and then Zeus. This kind of board state is exactly where Assembled Nightingale shines, and why I really think it's not... Because when I first built this deck, I saw it, and I was like, surely this must be a flex spot, right? Like, this card isn't that good. But then I realized shortly after I started playing it, like, oh, this is how you Zeus and out and do an opponent's, opponent's board. Because the Assembled Nightingale can attack directly. So you can always battle with it. Yep, here I am going to respond with Maxi. I did it a little prematurely. I should have waited until my opponent actually used the effect. Instead, I chained it on the normal summon. So, yep, slight misplay. Also, slight misplay here. Uh, actually, not even slight. This was a more major misplay. Where I should have Zeus in response to my opponent. Basically, I should have Maxi'd and Zeus both in response to Fractal's effect. Instead, I did the maxi too early, which was slight misplay, but didn't end up mattering. Uh, the Zeus did end up mattering because then the Omen banished my Zeus. It, I don't really have an excuse, I just wasn't thinking, honestly. So, yeah, I mean, our opponent's going to go into a Rugal here, but that's about all they can do. And as you can see, we even put them under another maxi, so we kind of just bullied the mirror match here into not really being able to do a whole lot and as you can see we have plenty of options in our hand we're obviously going to begin with a lightning storm just to get rid of the rugal our opponent's gonna chain rugal which i kind of figured was gonna happen but i thought they were gonna put like a nerval in defense mode but they just summoned a fractal in attack mode to get destroyed so um no yeah, that's fine we're gonna bird call and then our opponent i'm pretty sure just concedes at this point yep there they go so yeah, I wanted to show that game because I hadn't shown a real, like, exciting mirror match game yet. Um, also, time to duel if you're out there. I genuinely love your username. I think it's great. <laughs> Alright, so let's go on to the next replay. If I recall correctly, this was the last one we watched in the last video. So let's go ahead and move on to this next one. <laughs> There's always this, like lingering pause as the game loads as I'm like trying to remember more about this game before I say something out loud. All right, so yeah, I mean, our oh, we're going second here. Our opponent is playing a magician deck, which is cool because again, I re I really enjoyed Arc V. So, I actually have a soft spot for pendulums. I know there are some people who just don't like them. I know Konami sure doesn't seem to like them, but yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I have a soft spot for Arc V, so in turn I have a soft spot for Pendulum cards, especially Magician's decks. And this poor opponent, right? So we max C, and they actually set a monster and pass, they don't play into it, which I respect, you know? That's, that's fine, I do the same thing sometimes. But, they have the max C, ah, but we have the Ash for it, so like, they get wrecked by our max C, and they're not even affected by, uh, or, yeah, no. They get wrecked by our maxi, and we're not really affected by theirs. That's what I was going to say. Right? I said that right? Anyway. Yeah, as you can see, we're going to go into some fairly, like, kind of boring version of the combo, really. Like, it's a good thing we have D.D. Crow. You know, this is why I like having D.D. Crow as a one of. It's not only a niche, not even niche, it's got a lot of applicable use, but it's a somewhat niche hand trap, but it's a level one wing beast, so it can actually contribute to combos. Uh, which is really cool. I like its versatility in that way. I wish there were more hand traps like that, to be honest. Like, I don't know. 
just cards that can... I mean, I guess it depends on the deck more than the actual cards themselves, right? Because, I mean, you look at Sky Strikers. That makes use of a, a hand trap as a part of a combo. You use the Effect Veiler with the Halcliffax. <laughs> I can never say that card's name. Yeah, and then you go into the Axis... Or you go into the Selene, which gets the Veiler back, and then you go into Axis Code Talker. But, yeah, I mean, we're going to just start comboing off, and our opponent's going to have to concede it there. So here we've got another... Ooh, I almost delayed it, jeez. Uh, here we've got another loss, but as you can see, it's another 11-turn game. And as I've said many times in the past, I am all for keeping a loss if it was a genuinely good game. Although I am admittedly a little biased as to what I think a good game is when it's a win versus a loss, but... Yeah, this game is actually pretty interesting, right? So we're going to start off with a Fractal combo. We've got the Bird Call as well. So we can just go into the Warbler, we can set up the Cobalt Sparrow, and I'm like, oh yeah, we've already got a Wagtail even, like, we can just go into our standard combo here. And at a certain point, I am going to have to pause here, because... Dot, 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 wait for it. So here, we're going to add the Swallow, and when we use Swallow's effect, and summon the Nerval, I have to pause here, right? Because, for the first time during my opponent's turn, when I summoned these monsters, I saw a prompt for my opponent to respond, and then they didn't. And, that could only mean one thing, and that is Nibiru. So, I counted my summons up to this point, sure enough, I was very easily already at 5. So I think, I stop actually and I think to myself for a minute or two here, probably just a minute, but... Because I'm thinking like, okay, I know they have Nibiru, how much do I want to play into it? And at this point, I'm like, you know what, I've only committed one Recital Starling, I've got a Nerval to defend with. If my opponent had a Max C, I'd be pretty satisfied stopping here, so I'm going to treat Nibiru the same way. I'm just going to stop here and pass to my opponent and see what they do. Now, something to note. When you... I want to go to the end phase here, right? then my opponent is going to respond with Nibiru. Since my opponents played a monster and their board state changed, I don't move straight into the end phase, I'm going to get an option to go back into the main phase. Which is another reason I tried to test it out by ending the turn here. Because I knew, you know, if my opponent doesn't Nibiru, cool, I have some pieces left on board, my opponent's probably going to answer some of them. But at the very least, I'll have like a search with Nerval, maybe some of these birds will survive and I can do stuff with them. But... If they do Nibiru, I know I'm going to get an option to go back into my main phase. It's not going to be clear that that's the case when you watch the replay. It's going to look like they just Nibiru here. But I wanted to stop, pause here and point that out specifically. Because that was a pivotal moment in this game. So, yep, like I said, I went to move to the end phase here. The replay, unfortunately, does not reflect that. Um, the Nibiru is going to get summoned, I'm going to opt to continue with my main phase, because the Nerval Search is going to get me a Fractal, and I have not Normal Summoned yet. Here I can Special the Omen, and I can just go ahead and banish my opponent's Nibiru. And that is why that distinction was so important, and that is, again, part of the reason why I set up the way I did. Now you can see, oh my god, my opponent just set five cards, I'm like, kinda like, shitting myself a little bit here. So I decide, okay, I'm going to tribute some an Apex Avian, and they're going to flip Skill Drain. That's cool with me. I've got a bunch of big beat sticks I can hit with. So our opponent shows their true face as the dirty Eldritch player they are. Uh, I'm going to respond with Apex Avian, although I'm pretty sure this doesn't work. My opponent's going to flip another Skill Drain, but correct me if I'm wrong, that didn't make a difference, right? Because they already had Skill Drain face up. So I'm already not going to be able to resolve Apex Avian. I just want to, I want to ask the comments, I am correct in that, right? That flipping that second skill drain did not do anything for my opponent there? Okay, so they're going to have the set and pass, and then of course, you know, they're going to get the quick play spell, which is going to let them summon their golden boy. We do have the lightning storm here, so I'm going to go ahead and throw that down, but ah, our opponent's got the solemn judgment. Which I wonder if, like, because I don't feel like every Eldritch deck even plays Solemn Judgment, but if you're playing a deck that sets five back row, don't you, like, always want to play three Solemn Judgment? Four cards like Harpy's Feather Duster and Lightning Storm. I can see how in a best of three format you might want to side deck those because the opponent sides Harpies and Lightning Storm in, but uh, as always, we have to keep in mind 
we are playing a best of one format and we have to build our deck in a way where we can effectively play against a variety of decks and in a variety of, well, going first or second. Whereas, again, if you have the side deck, you can not only plan for certain matchups, but you can also put certain cards in specifically for going first or second. So, unfortunately, this is going to be <laughs> kind of like the slow kill that Eldritch is so infamous for. And ah, you can see we got them down to 1650. We were so close. This whole time, I'm thinking to myself, like... Okay, if I can, like, whip Harpy's Feather Duster and maybe make an assembled Nightingale, I can still pull this out. Or even, you know, I've got the Keros and the Tenki. Well, the Tenki actually doesn't do anything here, if I recall correctly. We've used all of our Fractals, right? There's Fractal 1, 2, and 3. Yep. Yeah. So Tenki is unfortunately dead here. That is kind of why I don't want to play more than one. I mean, not that I think this is going to happen a lot with only one copy. But, you know, it'll happen more with two copies, so that's why I hesitate. So yeah, I mean, we're just kind of setting our wagtails and waiting to see if we draw a Harpy's Feather Duster. But if I recall correctly, yeah, unfortunately we do not. So we have to set Maxi and now Special Chaos in order to summon it and defend. But our opponent's got the Counter Trap to negate it, and I'm just going to concede here because I know my opponent's got it. So yeah, I think that was the first time I actually like showed a match where Eldritch kind of does its thing. That's another reason I kept that duel is like, I mean, I don't know. It's did I really need to show it though? Haven't we all lived that experience? In any case, let's go ahead and move on to this next game against Gao here. Which, correct me if I'm wrong, is that not the uh, kid from the Velt in Final Fantasy VI? Is it his name Gao? God, I've only played Final Fantasy VI once. It's a great game, but I only played it once, and that was like... God, like eight years ago or something like that. Okay, so ah, we are playing against Altergeist here. So here we can actually show a game against a stun-type deck where we are able to pull through and come out with the win. It's not impossible, you know? It's so easily... I always talk about this concept of mentally conceding. It's so easy to be playing, you know, in this matchup, in this exact scenario, where we look at our hand and it's like, kind of weird, like workable, but weird. And then you see like, oh, our opponent's playing Altergeist. And it's so easy here to be like, oh, I have a janky hand and my opponent's playing an anti-meta deck. Oh, this game's probably not gonna go well, but no. No, you do not want to start thinking that way because once you start thinking that way, that's how you meant to, that's how you fall into like again what I refer to as mentally conceding, thinking about how we're going to lose the game before the game's you know before our turn is even up. I'm not saying that you know there it's impossible to lose before your turn is even up. No, that can definitely happen in this game, but like in this scenario, like look, we're we're totally fine. Yeah, our opponent's going to try to revive the multi-faker, but we've got the called by. I'm just going to go ahead and banish it. Now, interesting thing to note, I could have used DD Crow here, but I decided to save it for potential combo use. And as you can see, that is actually going to bite me in the ass here, because our opponent does follow up with Max C. So, I really should have used DD Crow against the um, multi-faker instead of the called by. But... I did think about it for a moment, and like I said, I ended up not using DD Crow because I thought I might need DD Crow to combo with later. But ultimately, like I said, it would it would have just been better to called by the Max C. I mean, obviously, I didn't know my opponent was going to Max C, but it still should have been something I was thinking about. Okay, here they're going to go into the Prime Banshee. They weren't able to set up a point in. Like, they weren't able to set up their hex Hextia to point to something, which was nice. So we at least had that going for us. Uh, and here is our friend Siloquitus. Siloquitus. I can't ever pronounce her name, but boy, do I do not... Boy, do I dislike this card. This is my least favorite card in Ultra Guys to play against. The bounce is really annoying. But our opponent's going to link it away here for a Hextia. I'm pretty sure they do this just to get both effects of Prime Banshee and of our friend whose name is difficult to pronounce. They're going to end up getting the trap back so they can just summon it back from the grave during our turn anyway. 
but we do at least still have DD Crow here, which I guess this actually did end up kind of working out. Uh, the fact that we didn't, or the fact that we called by instead of DD Crow earlier, because now we can DD Crow to get rid of our opponent's annoying bird thing. Because <laughs> I don't think Siliquitus is how you say it. Siliquitus? Oh, I'm sure, I'm so sure I'm butchering that. But now we're able to banish that. Now we don't have to deal with it. So now we can add the Sparrow. And I know our opponents got an Altergeist Protocol face down. They do end up having an Imperm as well, but I'm confident in our ability to play through a couple of negates. I don't think that's going to stop us from managing to get ahead on the board here. Yeah, again, it's it's not the negates that I'm worried about. It's always the Maxi. The Maxi is the thing that can consistently stop a lot of our effects. So our opponent's going to flip up the protocol in response to the Swallow being summoned so that they're ready to activate it at a moment's notice. They are not going to negate the Sparrow, but we are going to summon Recital Starling. Again, I'm just kind of throwing out feelers, right? Okay, here now I see they're willing to commit the protocol, so I'm like, okay, well, that is fine at this juncture, because if I recall correctly, I do still have my Normal Summon, and yes, I'm going to Normal Summon the Nerval. From there, we can go into the Omen. I want to specifically banish Hexia so that her second effect does not activate the one that lets them add an Altergeist card from the deck to the hand. Definitely don't want that, because I know my opponent from how they were setting cards earlier, that these are monsters. They don't have more back row to commit, and yet our opponent's just going to concede here. As you can see, we can still combo off, and I'm going to be able to eventually go for, like, the Recital Starling, and then the, with these two, the Assembled Nightingale, and then we can go into the Utopic Draco, so we can just negate the monster effect. Again, I know they have mostly monsters, and not really any back row left at that stage. So we've got one final duel here to take a look at for today. Then, yeah, I'm, I don't know, I'm pretty satisfied with our opening hand. Even in a going second scenario. Ah, yes, this is against the Gaga guys. So we have the Ash for their Automata which is pretty devastating because it not only costs them their card they discarded, but Automata itself, leaving them with only three cards in hand. So, yeah, we've got a pretty solid combo here. I'm going to begin with Fractal, but, ooh, our opponent's got the Ash as well. So we can't set up our Sparrow, which is a little bit annoying here. I am ultimately still going to summon Warbler, but oh, our opponent's got the Max C as well. So I'm thinking to myself, right, okay, how much am I going to play into this Max C? And I'm not going to play into it all anymore. <laughs> I'm just going to special one, set Nerval, and pass. So our opponent's only got three cards. I'm feeling pretty confident, but... Their three cards are actually going to let them go into a pretty nice combo here. You see they're going to be able to search their Automata Para once again. They're going to get it back. There's like, this is my, I you know, I'm familiar with the, you know, uh, Utopia, like, dot deck. I, I was around during Zexel. I saw some of this uh, legacy support get released, but I'm not familiar with some of the more, like, the structure deck stuff. I've played against this deck before, like, a couple of times, but not, like, a whole lot, so... Uh, yeah, the video's getting on a bit, so I'm just gonna go ahead and... Uh, you know what? I don't need to throw it fast forward. This game's short enough. Uh, I do maxi, and our opponent's going to still go into their special summons anyway, right? I mean, at this stage, they kind of don't really have... It's not, that this, uh, the, the, yeah. it's not necessarily that they don't have a choice, but it really is not too bad for them to give me a few draws, considering my relatively weak board, and their, by comparison, relatively strong board state once I've... Um, once they've comboed through. However, there is always a downside to playing into Max C, even if it is the most advantageous play like it was for my opponent in this scenario. They're still going to give me a whole bunch of draws, which is going to give me more than enough ammo to fight back with on my turn. Our opponent's going to try to add with the Utopic Sage here, and I, I definitely don't want them to go into further combos. So I'm just going to Ash, and I'm just going to cut it off right there. They are going to equip the Ashura Strike so they can smash through all of our stuff. I kind of feel like I would have gotten OTK'd, honestly, if I hadn't ashed that Utopic Sage, but I'm actually not familiar enough with Utopia.deck to really know if that was the case. I am familiar enough with this deck to know that they're going to probably go into the Utopic Draco... Not, not, not Utopic Draco, the F-Zero, the um, Hope Harbinger, number... 
Uh, we'll see what number it is in a second here. But yeah, no, I'm just going to begin with Feather Duster and try to provoke a response from my opponent. My opponent is going to respond with Utopia Dragonar's ability. And with it, they are going to summon out their... Uh, it is number 38. I did remember that right. It's Hope Harbinger. Yep. Now, fortunately, the way that the chain is structured, they can't negate the Harpy's Feather Duster here. Not that it really even needed to be negated. We're going to Ash our opponent, or not Ash, we're going to Imperm our opponent's Hope Harbinger before we drop the Lightning Storm, and that's going to be good enough to get the Concede from our opponent. All right, so that is all we've got for today. Once again, as always, I want to thank everyone for watching. Before we end the video, since I showed the deck in the last video, but not this one, I'm going to end by once again showing off my deck list here. If you've watched my deck profile video about Tri-Brigade Lyrilisk, it is by and large the same deck. The main difference is that I dropped one copy of Cobalt Sparrow in favor of one copy of Fire Formation Tanky. And again, the reason that I made this change was that the Sparrow doesn't lend itself to many combos in hand on its own. It's more of like a, a searching combo piece, and it, it needs other cards to special summon it in order to get going. But it can't start up combos on its own. Whereas Tenki for Fractal is a great way to unbrick a lot of otherwise dead hands. So, once again, just explaining that is why I made that change there. Um, as always, I'm constantly thinking about decks to, or cards to possibly add and change with my decks, and if I make any adjustments in the future, I will be sure to show them off as soon as I can. But let's go ahead and finish up by going through the extra deck here before we sign off. As always, I want to thank everyone for watching. I really greatly appreciate it. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for today. This is XLex, signing out. Have a good one.